אשריהו איש אשר לא הולך בצס רשויים ודרך התוהים לא עמוד ובמושב ליצים לא יושב כי מסורס אדוני חפצו ובסורסו יגע יומם ולילה והיו קץ שולסו ופלגי מים אשר פירו ייתן ואיתו ויעולהו לא ייבול וכל אשר יעשה יצליח לא כן הראשויים כי אם קמות אשר תדפנו רוח על כן לא יקום הראשויים במשפט וכתוהים בדס צדיקים כי יודע אדוני דרך צדיקים ודרך רשעים תאבד. מזמר לדוד אדוני מי יגור בהולך ומי ישכון בהר קודשך. הולך תום מי מפועל צדק ודובר אמס בלבבו. לא רוג על הלשונו לא עשו לראי הוא רעו וחרפו לא נושא על קרובו. ניב זה בעיניו נמאס ואס יראי אדוני יכבד נשבע להורה ולא יאמיר, כספו לא נוסן בנשך, ושוחד על נוקי לא לקוח. עושה אלה לא ימות לעולם. מזמר לדוד, אדוני ראוי לו אחסור. בנוס דשא ירביצני על מי מנוחו שנא הלני. נפשי ישובב, ינחני במגלי צדק למען שמו. גם כי אילך בגי צלמובס. לא ירורו כי עתו עמודי, שבתכו ומשענתכו, היי מו ינחמוני. תערוך לפני שולחון נגד צוררוי, דישנת בשמן ראשי, כוסי רוויו. אך טוב וחסד ירדפוני כל ימי חיי, ושבתי בבייס אדוני לאורך ימים. here now to say goodbye to Herb Geduld, Chaim Yecheskel ben Yaakov Yoshua. The Gemara says that of all the different praises that one can offer different types of people, because there's a Gemara at the end of Sota that describes different character traits that various people possess that when they left this world, everyone got the sense that this certain type of person had was no longer to be found. And whenever I think about Herb, even just a little bit, one of the terms that is used by Chazal to describe certain select, unique individuals is the phrase, Ish ho-eshkolos. Uh, eshkol is a cluster, like a cluster of grapes. And the Gemara says that a Ish ho-eshkolos is a Ish shahakol bo. A man who has, he's got everything. There isn't a trait that is lacking, even if it seems in other people, other great people, to contradict other traits that they may have. But there are certain people who are able to manage, and they put it all together. So that if you were to score them on one of those personality charts, and someone ranks a 10 in this one, you assume he's a 2 in the other one, or vice versa. And yet Herb just scored all, high on all of them. That was, that was who he was. That was his personality. That, that was the nature. He was a jack of all trades and a master of all of those trades as well. Now I want to call on Herb's son-in-law, Alan, to give some divrei hesped. As you have heard, my father-in-law, Rav Chaim Yecheskel ben Yaakov Yehoshua, was a remarkable man. <clears throat> I can say without qualification that he was one of the most intelligent 
and erudite individuals I have ever met. There was nothing that he did not know and no subject that was beyond his comprehension. It was a privilege to be his son-in-law and on behalf of myself, my wife and my family, I'm asking Mechila to my father-in-law for not showing him the kavod that he so richly deserved. The Gemara in Sanhedrin on Daf Peiches Ahmed Beis says, Ezo Ezehu ben Olam Haba. Who is a person who is Zoha to Olam Haba? The Gemara answers and says, Anvesan Ushval Berech Shayef Ayol Shayef Venofik Vigoris be Oraisa Tadira Velo Machzik Tivuse Lenofshe. The person who is Zoha to Olam Haba is a modest person, a person who is humble, and who enters bowing and leaves bowing, and a person who learns Torah constantly and not takes credit for it. The Marsha comments that there are three areas that can cause a person to be a Balgaiva, to be haughty. They are mental prowess, physical prowess, and monetary wealth. I can say unequivocally that my father-in-law, Rav Chaim Mecheskel ben Yaakov Yehoshua, was an onov sheba onovim in each of these respects. I am certain that he is enjoying his place in the Yeshiva Shemaila and in Olam Haba. My father-in-law was so talented in so many ways. With respect to mitzvahs, he always went above and beyond. For example, he always hosted Tashlich in his backyard and insisted on feeding the olam and buying fish each year for the mitzvah. In the last months and weeks, and even on the first day of Rosh Hashanah, he was there in shul and insisted on standing up when you really didn't have to. It was only a min hug at best. But that was him. He always went on above and beyond with respect to misfos. There are so many memories that we have and will treasure forever. My father-in-law was an incredible grandpa to his grandchildren. When grandpa entered the room, the grandchildren literally jumped for joy. Whether it was dancing with grandpa when he played his records, trips to wonderful and interesting adventures, Hanukkah parties with more menorahs than we could count, playing with his flashcards or collecting nuts in his backyard, spending time with grandpa and with grandma, Yebado Lachayim, was pure and under unadulterated simcha. What a tremendous chus that is. I have many memories of my father-in-law. The one that is most poignant for me is one that showed me very early on what kind of person he was and the kind of person my mother-in-law, Yebado Lachaim Admea Ve'esrim Shana, is. The story goes back before I joined the, the family. When I first met Lisa, I was at Ben Bias at the home of Miriam Jaffe. When Lisa and I started to become serious, I asked Miriam about the Gedulds and what kind of family they were. After listening to my question, Miriam looked me in the face and told, told me the following story. It was the New Year's Eve after Arthur, her husband's tragic death. Miriam was at home that evening feeling very alone and very depressed. She had resigned herself to spending the evening alone when all of a sudden there was a knock on the door. 
She opened the door, and in walked in my father-in-law and mother-in-law. With a bottle of champagne and delicacies from Lax and Mendel's bakery. My father-in-law, in his own inimitable style, told Miriam that they thought that she would be lonely that evening, so they thought they would just stop in and spend the evening with her. They brought Simcha, great Simcha, to her. Miriam looked at me and said, that's the kind of parents Lisa has, and that's the kind of person my father-in-law was. He always thought of others. My father-in-law brought joy and simcha to our family and to the entire community. Who could forget the letters in Yiddish that Grandpa would bring to every simcha and read from what we thought was the President of the United States? We literally cried from laughing so hard. And I know that he enjoyed watching us laugh as much as, he enjoy as we enjoyed listening to it. He was an incredible devoted husband to my mother-in-law, Yabad al an incredible father to Lisa, Ilana, and David, Yabad al Shana, and an incredible grandfather and great-grandfather. There are some people who go through life marking time and hardly making a dent. To everyone who met my father-in-law, he left a smile and unforgettable memories. He truly had a Simchas Chaim, as his name was Chaim, and made sure that others had Simchas Chaim as well. Mir Hashem, he should be a Melis Yosher for the entire family and for all of Klal Israel. Thank you for all coming today to honor the memory of my father, Chaim Yecheskel ben Yaakov Yehoshua Zecher Livracha. I believe that my father was a Renaissance man. The dictionary definition of a Renaissance man is a cultured man of the Renaissance who's knowledgeable, educated, or, profi or proficient in a wide range of fields. A present day man who has acquired profound knowledge or proficiency in more than one field. This was my father. He was an author, a playwright, an artist, a carpenter, an avid gardener, a world traveler, photographer, and a Jewish history buff. My father was kind, caring, and had a great sense of humor. He had a great command of the English language and always made us laugh when he spoke with his many different accents. He loved to read, whether it was American or Jewish history, science, and astronomy. He read and read and, it, and didn't bother too much with novels or fiction since he felt it didn't expand his knowledge base. We grew up in a world without Google and Siri, but we didn't need it. We had my father, the world book encyclopedias, and his amazing library. My father's role models and mentors were his uncle Eddie and his Zaydi, Rabbi Ozer Paley. His thirst for knowledge and his unwavering commitment to Yiddishkeit and family came from both of these men. As a youth, he was a member of the Shomer Hadati, which was the precursor to B'nai Akiva, which instilled in him a love of Israel. He was drafted and served in the U.S. Marine Corps and served less than a year, but thankfully was never sent overseas. My father married his soulmate, Toby, in 1953 and they lived in Cleveland, Detroit, St. James, Minnesota, Savion, Israel, and finally Cleveland. So strong was his desire to move to Israel in 1960 that my father was willing to move from Detroit with a large Jewish community to St. James, Minnesota, a town of a thousand, and with our arrival, a population of five Jews, for a job that he knew would move him and his family to Israel. My parents always said 
that their happiest and most fulfilling time as a couple was raising my two sisters and I in Savia and Israel. When we returned to Cleveland in 1967, my parents enjoyed estate sales in which they furnished their new home, and my father would always like to say that our home was decorated in early American discard. <laughs> His love of gardening took root in Israel where we had banana and lemon trees and orange trees. He continued to be an avid gardener and loved his backyard where he and my mother would carefully plant and patience around all of the trees. Every spring, he would restock the fish ponds with fish and, ver and various aquatic flowering plants. He was very proud of his garden and wanted to share the beauty with others. We had two weddings in the backyard. One was my sister Ilana, and the other was Rabbi Yehuda and Chana Appel. For many years, the highlight of Rosh Hashanah was when my parents hosted Tashlich in our backyard for the Heights Jewish Center Synagogue, as well as others in the community. My dad loved his wood, his wood shop in the basement where he made everything from bookcases to picture frames to furniture and wooden toy trains and cars for his grandchildren. He was most proud of his handmade Hanukkiot or menorahs, which he gave away as gifts for, for Hanukkah. My father also tried to replicate Jackson Pollock paintings on large canvases and took art and sculpting lessons later in life. Sometimes he would proudly show us his masterpieces, and we weren't sure who made them, his grandkids or him. <laughs> he authored two books, one a technical book on zinc plating and the other Israel Inside Out, a memoir of the six plus years our family lived in Israel and never made the New York Times bestseller list, but it's a great read. He was also a columnist for the Cleveland Jewish News for many years and wrote about many eclectic Jewish topics. He was a, man, he was a handyman who could fix most anything from electrical to plumbing, but you didn't want to get in his way if he didn't fix it right the first time. He built me a non-motorized go-kart, which was a lot of fun, but my mom didn't really like it because it didn't have brakes which was a problem when the hill on Belvoir didn't end on Cedar Road. My father took up skiing at the age of 45. After dropping me and my friends off at Brandywine and seeing how much fun we had, he decided to take lessons. Within a year or two, we were skiing the Colorado Rockies. As gifts for bar mitzvah boys, he would treat them to a day on the slopes, and we weren't sure who had a better time. Some of the fondest memories I have were the many vacations we took together as a family, crisscrossing America, east and west, north and south, Yellowstone, Mount Shasta, California, Crater Lake, Oregon, Grand Tetons, Jackson Hole, the Northeast, and of course, Disney. As kids, we didn't appreciate all the museums and sites along the way. We couldn't wait to get out of the car and go to the hotel pool or run down the motel hallways throwing ice down each other's backs. Chagim were always special and something we always looked forward to. Pesach meant dad's questions on index card and his unique Sephardi rendition of Chad Gadja, which all of his grandchildren know by heart. When we leave this life, the only thing we take with us is our good deeds. My father left this world with a Keser Shem Tov, a crown of a good name. I can truly say I never heard him speak Lashon Hara, derogatory speech, never heard him utter a negative word about family, friends, or associates. His acts of chesed were quiet and unassuming with no fanfare, but were transformative on the recipients. His dedication to tefillah prayer was remarkable. Even when it became very difficult to walk to shul, he never considered moving because he wanted to be close to his second home, the Heights, the Heights Jewish Center. Thank you to Rabbi David D Davidovich, Izzy Mendenhall, Fred Bolitan, Dr. Joel Peerless, Rob Altshuler, and Mr. Harold Mayles for transporting and assisting my father while he was in shul. And if, any, and if I left anyone out, I truly apologize. Your kindness and caring was appreciated by him as well as by our family. Also, thank you to Shifra's girls, D, Michelle, 
and Sheila, who were my father's aides, who took extraordinary care of him. My mother, Toby, a bride at 18 years old, took her wedding vows very seriously. They were best friends, partners in raising a family. My mother truly was his Ezer Konegdo, his helpmate. When my father was first diagnosed with heart disease over 30 years ago, it became my mom's mission to ensure a healthy lifestyle. This meant complete change from meat and potatoes to a vegetarian Pritikin diet before it was popular. Your selfless love and devotion, especially over the last 10 years, was remarkable. You demonstrated what commitment and love mean, and you truly are an inspiration to us all. How special and significant that on my father's last day of life on this earth, he was praying to the Almighty on Rosh Hashanah, the Jewish New Year, the birthday of the world. He davened the entire service, which was close to four and a half hours, standing up every time that the Oran was opened, with my mother watching carefully from the balcony, making sure that he was okay. I had this chut, or merit, of sitting down next to my father for over an hour during the service. He came home from shul, enjoyed a festive lunch with his wife and soulmate of 64 years. What an incredible send-off. Finally, I want to share with you something I read from Anna Quindland, a novelist and journalist who was writing a story about how the homeless suffer in the winter months. She found one of her best teachers who happened to be homeless on the boardwalk at Coney Island and it was December. He would panhandle on the boulevard, sleep in a church when the temperature went below freezing, hide from the police behind the tilt-a-whirl and cyclone. But he said that the most of the time he stayed on the boardwalk facing the water, even when it got cold, and he wore a newspaper around him. And Anna Quinlan asked him why. Why didn't he just go to one of the shelters? Why didn't he check himself into the hospital for shelter? And he stared out at the ocean and he said, look, look at the view, look at the view. During my father's lifetime, I know he appreciated the view. He can be extremely proud of the legacy he leaves for his children, his 16 grandchildren, and 24 grandchildren that he adored and loved so much. I think it's a message for all of us to look at the view and take it in every day and appreciate and be grateful for everyone that is meaningful to us and for all of the beautiful and magnificent views. Dad, I ask Mechila forgiveness if I was in any way disrespectful and did not give you proper kavod. Thank you for being a tremendous role model for us and our family. I miss and love you. Yehisi Baruch, may your memory be for a blessing. My dear father-in-law, I was taught the neshama of Niftar hovers around till burial, so I'd like to speak to you and allow all gathered to listen in. I met you only last year, coming in for a too brief a visit to meet the wonderful parents of my dear wife, Ilana. In the days we spent together, I got to see the simcha you brought to the world and to each and every member of your family. Your warmth, humor, care, and interest in all was very, very apparent. It gave me such pleasure not just to listen to your grandchildren in, Is in Israel speak of you, but to see the shine on their faces when they did. On the way here, Ilana asked, why is it she can't say brachot or tefillot? I told her, you can still talk to God, just not do mitzvot, since the niftar can no longer do mitzvot once it leaves this world, and so we don't want to make it envious of those who can. 
May we all continue to do mitzvot and mention your name to give you the continued aliyat neshama you have earned on this earth. It is a chut to have met you and spoken with you this past year. First of all, I want to thank everyone for coming. Um, I have to ask for Mechila from my uh, father-in-law. Clearly, I, I want to ask for Mechila because I don't cook as much for David that I should. That's number one. But I do want to ask for Mechila. I loved my father-in-law. I want to ask for forgiveness if I didn't give him the kavod or the honor that he so rightly deserved. So um, as you heard, my father-in-law has uh, 16 uh, grandchildren and 24 great-grandchildren. So it was very difficult. Uh, we would be here for a long time today uh, if each of them who wanted to uh, communicate to you their love and affection for uh, their grandfather. So um, I'm going to read from uh, Sara Leah Karp, uh, Lana's daughter, um, her thoughts about her grandfather. To our grandfather and great-grandfather, we wish to honor and thank for funny voices and silly songs, for never reading the actual story out loud, for long walks in the woods of Harnof and piggyback rides in the rain, for pennies on the acorn and countless birthday checks, for countless books and a peek at different cultures through endless pictures of endless travels, for inviting presidents to our simchas and definitely for waltzing Matilda at Sheva Brachot, for tough love and big hugs, for American gifts and a silly skunk, for instilling culture in your Israeli clan by schlepping us around to museums, for all you gave us far long before we were born by planting the Israeli roots, for all that you were, for all that we are, we are all there with our hearts on your last journey, forever remembered and never forgotten. So I will next read, um, this is my son, uh, Noah, uh, who was also in Israel and uh, wanted also for me to share these thoughts with you. Grandpa Herb, carpenter, painter, writer, gardener, reader, husband, father, grandfather, great-grandfather. I remember as a young boy seeing the paintings, the books, the Jewish news articles. I didn't quite appreciate it then, but I had a distinct feeling that my grandfather was a special man. There are many ways to describe Grandpa, but I think what was special was his ability to incorporate all of his passions and skills as a grandfather and to pass on his curiosity and passion to his grandkids. Every experience was a shared learning opportunity, whether it was going to the museum, going to shul, listening to classical music, or discussing current events. I always walked away with something new to think about. Asking questions at the Pesach Seder and playing dreidel on Hanukkah were precious memories that Grandpa left for us. Grandpa, it is you who I strive to be. Humble, consistent, graceful, committed to family and faith, and intellectually curious. He was a personification of so many of the values we hold dear as Jews and humans tasked with living lives of humility and moral grace. I would like to end with words written by Walt Whitman, which I think really resonate with the life Grandpa lived. Do I contradict myself? Very well. Then I contradict myself. I am large. I contain multitudes. Grandpa's life was one of many multitudes, and all of us have been lucky to have been enriched and exposed to this wonderful man's multitudes. May his memory be for a blessing. Herb had within him such a multitude of types that were really no contradiction. 
that it was and still is possible that someone who knew him in one area of his life simply didn't know about another area of his life. So there are people who got to knew him in the field of science and engineering, chemical engineering, would think, look at this, look at this engineer, look at this scientist. He's a scientist, he's not an artist. And people who knew about his art would assume, oh, these artists, they're poets, they don't write prose, yet he wrote prose. People who would hear him speak Hebrew or knew, about, knew him in Israel or his life in Israel or saw him in Israel thought, this is a man of Eretz Yisrael, this is a Zionist. Such a man couldn't possibly fit in in Chutz Aretz. And people who heard him speaking Yiddish here in Cleveland in Chutz Aretz couldn't imagine that this was a man of Eretz Yisrael. People who saw how close he was with, with Toby would say, ah, this is a man who's just all devoted to his wife. That's probably, he's just a family man. Got his wife, the kids, the grandkids. People who are family men of that caliber, they're just devoted to their family. They don't have time to be busy with community affairs. And yet there he was, from one end to the other. When I saw this in him, I understood for once an expression that I never understood. The Gemara describing Adam Harishon said, Adam Harishon could see from one end of the world to the other end of the world. And people who wish to understand that it means that Adam Harishon was 10,000 feet tall or something like that, they could, be ex they could be excused for thinking that perhaps that's the shot, because what else could it mean? But then you meet Herb and you understand what that expression means, to see from one end of the world to the next. People who saw how gentle of a man he was, literally a gentleman, wouldn't have assumed how stubborn he could be. But people who saw that stubbornness in him, and the stubbornness, I'll tell you, was so painful to behold at times, especially in these last couple of years. You'd come into shul, and you didn't know it was like a, one of those bobble heads, but it wasn't the head that was bobbling, it was the feet, the hips to know every morning how is he going to make it to shul and he makes it into shul and then he would be so stubborn he would be sitting there and it's at one of those parts of davening where everyone's seated comfortably and then it comes something like a, a chazi kaddish and there he is and say he hears the yizgadal and he starts to get up and the whole shul just wants to yell. Instead of saying, Yizgadav, Yizgadav, Shmei Rabbah, and say, Amen, they just want to say, Sit down, Herb. I felt guilty, you know, these last few months. You know, I've made some decisions at times. When you get to one of those half cottages, and I've said, You know what? I'm going to sit this one out. It's just, but then I think of Herb, who's getting up, who's Moser Nefesh for a Chatzi Kaddish. Herb was Moser Nefesh for a Chatzik Kaddish. Someone opens the Aron again. He would be commemorating a yard site, and he cared so much about the shul for every yard site. His parents' yard sites, Toby's parents' yard sites, every Farvarfana aunt and uncle that had ever been heard of. We got plenty of cake and cookies and juice during all those yard sites, so much so that. Rabbi Shur once told him, Ken Yirbu, all of these yard sites, you're feeding us well. But again, to come and to, uh, to be devoted in that way, he was, the, by doing all of these things, he was, the, he was the conscience of the shul and a conscience to remember past generations. Of course, thanks to him and Toby that the shul never forgot Rabbi Paley who could have been forgotten, you know, you have to go past Rabbi Shur, past Rabbi Porath, and then to remember. But he made a point, and it was a beautiful point to remember that kind of history of the shul. 
I once joked a few years ago that he was the only one left in our shul who was around at the founding of the shul 150 years ago. <laughs> and while he wasn't there, he had that conscience that he might as well have been there because he knew. And when the shul ce celebrated the 150th, and he knew, and he pointed out who the founders were, and he knew the founders' children, and he knew the house where the shul got started. And he had that akshanus, he had that stubbornness that for years on Simchas Torah, everyone spoke about Tashlich. But then on Simchas Torah, he would get up and he would lead the singing of uh, Ein Kadir Kashem. And he'd stand up on a chair to sing it. And you can imagine what standing on that chair looked like the last couple of years. But you want to stand on that herb, you don't have to stand on a chair. You're Yotze, that piyut, even if you don't stand on a chair. But again, that, that ava, that love that he had for the shul, he was our conscience in all of these matters. When I came to Cleveland, and a friend said, where are you going? What's the name of your shul? Heights Jewish Center. Herb Geduld, he's the only one who can write a 500-word article about stickers on bananas and make it interesting. <laughs> Even as he got wobbly, he still had a sharp wit. And even when he wouldn't say anything, you could see the wit behind his eyes. Last year, meaning two years ago, on Erev Rosh Hashanah, he fell in Shul. And I remember thinking then, and everyone said this, I came home on Motzei Shabbos, I didn't tell my wife the whole Yantif, the whole Shabbos. On Motzei Shabbos, I looked at my wife and I paused enough that she knew I was going to say something difficult and she said, what happened? And I said, Herb. And she's like, what? He has nine lives. That doesn't even make sense. And I was like, that's right. And I think the eighth life was last year, Erev Rosh Hashanah. And Mir Yah HaKadosh Baruch Hu gave him that last one good shtark year, and then there he was sitting in Shul, Rosh Hashanah morning, hearing the Tekios. And then Keheref Ayan, Yontif afternoon. We use the phrase, Yehi Zichro Baruch, because it's true. Invoking these Zichronos, like we mentioned on Rosh Hashanah, invokes so many, br invokes bracha. But there are so many different types of memories of who he was that you could just say it over and over again. Yehi Zichro Baruch as a husband, Yehi Zichro Baruch as a writer, Yehi Zichro Baruch as a father, Yehi Zichro Baruch as a, fa as a grandfather and great grandfather, Yehi Zichro Baruch as a scientist, Yehi Zichro Baruch as an artist, Yehi Zichro Baruch as someone who learns Torah, who's Koveya Itim. Yehi Zichro Baruch as someone who's capable of deep analysis of history, he is Baruch as someone who is just hilarious beyond belief when he switches that switch on. The family is in pain, the community is in pain, our shul is in pain, but we have to take that pain and transform it. And the way I think we can transform it is by thinking, when we think along all of these lines of all the different types of person that he was, to realize that it doesn't do justice to him to try to just take on or fill in one area. So we have to find a way even ourselves in a world that's so divided, where we divide and then we subdivide and we subdivide more and we subdivide more, that here's a man who didn't have to do that to take within us the capability of being so many people in this beautiful, beautiful unity. And in that sense, I say, Yehi Zichur Baruch. Please rise for the Kelmale. Amen.
Omole Rachamim, Shoichein, Bameromim, Hametzei, Minuchanechom, No, Al Kanfei Ashechino, Vimaalos, Kedoshim, Utarim, Kazor, Rakia, Mazirim, Es Nishmas, Rav Chaim Echeskov, and Rav Yaakov Yoshua, Shaholach, Lioilomo, Babur, Shanach, Mispalim, Balas Karas, Nishmoso, Began Eden to Hemenu Chaso, Lochem Balarachamim, Yasireu Viseser Kenaf of Leo Lamim, Bitsrar Bitsrara Chaimis Nishmaso, Adonai Unachaloso, Yonuk Visholom Amishkovo, Vinomar, Amen. The burial will be at Bed Olam Cemetery. The family will be sitting Shiva at the Shabbos home, 2459 Brentwood Road, until Friday at 2.30 p.m. <laughs>